Hi, everybody. So again, I'm Jacob Barrandes. I'm in the Harvard Physics Department. Um, my talk is going to be uh, about quantum field theory, um, in particular, how quantum or field theoretic is quantum field theory. I'm not going to provide a completely general answer to this question. Uh, I'm just going to um, uh, point out a couple of, of areas where we can say something uh, about this. Okay, so this is based on a bunch of papers. Uh, I can go back and, and refer to these later if people want to look them up. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to talk about quantum field theory, but in particular, um, I'm going to talk about which features of quantum theory are inherently quantum or field theoretic, uh, which features actually already make sense the level of a single classical point particle. Uh, here's a list of some of the things I'll be talking about in this talk. In particular, uh, there's a really beautiful uh, quantum mechanical classification of different particle types that goes back to Wigner in the 1930s. Um, I'll review a, a construction that, it, that parallels this quantum construction for the classical case. That, that's not new results, but it will provide a basis for the stuff I'll talk about later. I guess spin is really the, 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 the topic of the day. I'll have a, a lot to say about spin and uh, to what extent we can understand it manifesting already the level of a single classical point particle. Um, uh, again, th these are results that are, are generally known. Um, there will be some new results uh, here. Uh, in particular, the emergence of electromagnetic gauge invariance. Again, all the level of a single classical point particle, the Higgs mechanism, uh, and a detailed study of elementary dipole moments. So I guess the first thing is, why should we care about any of this? Well, classical point particles are generally simpler than quantum mechanics, let alone field theory, and either it's classical or quantum uh, versions. Um, and anytime you can provide a new perspective on, on old ideas, especially a new perspective that may be a little simpler and more intuitive to understand. Um, well, this is a form of scientific progress that, that can also sometimes lead to new insights. Anytime you can add new intuition to old ideas, there's the possibility you could see something you couldn't see before. But there are other motivations. Um, uh, and these include uh, refuting a number of claims and lore that one often hears about classical physics. Classical angular momentum uh, doesn't make sense without something actually rotating. Uh, even if it, if it does, there's no notion of having fixed intrinsic spin without quantization. Uh, and, and then other things that one uh, sees in, in literature, sometimes in textbooks, that magnetic forces cannot do work. Uh, and a famous result that goes back to Niels Bohr's PhD thesis that diamagnetism cannot arise classically. Uh, we'll see that all of these are incorrect. Okay, so uh, when people say particle physics nowadays, usually they mean relativistic quantum field theory. Um, but what I'd like to, 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 I guess, emphasize in this talk is uh, there's a whole field of classical particle physics that really is about particles, classical particles, not classical particle physics. Um, and, and one way to think about this is it's the set of features uh, that already show up the level of classical point particles that, that nicely parallel things that one sees in the quantum case. Um, and presumably there are more such features that uh, I, I don't know about yet that, that are not uh, included in this talk that raise further questions about exactly how quantum or field theoretic quantum field theory really is and what features already show up the level of classical point particles. So this is an outline of the talk. Uh, there's a theory side. Uh, I'll review a reformulation of the Lagrangian approach for classical systems that will be useful for our discussion of relativistic systems. Uh, I'll review Wigner's classification of particle types where he uses the the Poincaré group. This is the set of transformations that make sense in, in classical space-time, uh, and then show how this Wigner showed how, how how this leads to a very natural way to classify what kinds of particle types can exist in nature. And I'll I'll present the classical counterpart of this, and this is a, a, a known set of results in the literature. Um, then I'll apply this uh, to the development of the theory of of classical particles with intrinsic spin and their dynamics, and we'll see the emergence of gauge invariance in the Higgs mechanism at the level of a single classical point particle. Uh, time permitting, I'll talk about uh, like applications of this. We'll, I'll talk about how we can use this formalism for analyzing work done by electromagnetic fields. Uh, and um, in particular, we'll study this question about magnetic fields and their capacity to do work uh, on point particles. Uh, I'll, uh, go I'll, I'll talk about this result from Bohr about classical diamagnetism and the implications of, of these ideas for that. Uh, and then with a little bit of extra time, I'll, I'll talk about uh, implications this may have for interpretations of quantum theory. In particular, this might be of particular interest to people who take a Bohmian attitude toward quantum, quantum field theory. Just establishing conventions, I'll work in units with C is one and the mostly positive metric for special relativity.
So the first thing I'm going to need is this alternative Lagrangian formulation for uh, systems that will be very useful for studying relativistic systems. What's nice about this is even before we mention any relativity, uh, this formalism already anticipates a number of uh, key features of, of the relativistic case, which is very interesting. Um, these are not new ideas. They go back a long way. The earliest reference I could find for them was a paper by Dirac in 1926. I don't think it's the first place where it was. Um, and this approach is not new, uh, and it's used frequently in a variety of areas, like in world line world sheet quantization and string theory. So the starting place is we start with a generic classical system, or at least a system that, that is generic but admits a Lagrangian formulation. So we have degrees of freedom with uh, you know, Q sub alpha, where alpha takes values of some index set. There's a time parameter. There's an action functional, which is an integrated Lagrangian. In this expression, dots denote derivatives with respect to the time parameter. We have canonical momenta. We have the Hamiltonian. You vary the action, you get the Euler-Lagrange equations. This is all standard stuff. The first thing we do to, to move beyond this uh, standard picture is we introduce a, a smooth monotonic but otherwise arbitrary parameter lambda, little lambda. Um, we re-express everything in terms of, of little lambda. We take our old time parameter, we reparameterize it in terms of lambda. The integral measure dt becomes d lambda t dot, where dots now denote derivatives with respect to this new parameter. Uh, derivatives of, of q and other uh, functions with respect to t, be, uh, they turn into q dot over t dot. Um, we can rewrite our action functional, uh, uh, our, our previous action functional in terms of a, uh, a, a new uh, formula and that we can replace uh, the old L with this sort of script L. Uh, and we get script L literally by just doing this change of variables in the integral. Uh, the new L is equal to T dot multiplied by the old L, where again, dots are now derivatives with respect to this new arbitrary smooth parameter. Um, and if we re-express uh, this all in terms of uh, canonical Menton Hamiltonians, we get this expression over here. I want to draw your attention here to the relative minus sign that shows up over here. That's going to be important. You can already see something that looks vaguely uh, relativistic here, like a, 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 a kind of like a Lorentzian kind of dot product. And we'll see that, that, that this is in fact the case. Um, so now we're going to treat T kind of like an extra degree of freedom. It has its own canonical momentum in this, in this way of thinking. You compute DL DT dot, so the usual formula for canonical momentum but now taking derivatives with respect to this new formula for the Lagrangian uh, with respect to T dot. And the canonical momentum we get is minus the Hamiltonian, the original Hamiltonian that we, that we got from our original Lagrangian. It's natural at this point to introduce an upper and lower index notation, even though at this point, we're not assuming our degrees of freedom have anything to do with space. The Q alphas are not assumed to be spa spatial degrees of freedom. We introduce raised index variables and lowered index variables according to the usual convention, upper indexed plus, lower indexed minus. Uh, for the time in, in, in for the time indexed uh, quantities and then the the other quantities uh, upper and lower don't do anything um, with this upper and lower index formulation the uh, time degree of freedom q upper t which is just t uh, and and its corresponding canonical momentum are on a, a much more similar footing to our old degrees of freedom and and their canonical momenta uh, the canonical momenta uh, for our um, time degree of freedom they take a very similar form to to what it was for the other ones um, the Euler-Lagrange equations have a, a, a very symmetrical looking uh, uh, relationship. You might wonder, well, how can there be another Euler-Lagrange equation coming from the time degree of freedom? We already had all of our Euler-Lagrange equations. The uh, additional Euler-Lagrange equation uh, that comes from our new time degree of freedom just expresses this relationship, the total time derivative of the Hamiltonian is equal to minus the partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to time. Uh, and this uh, ensures that if the Lagrangian has no explicit time dependence, then the total Hamiltonian has no total time dependence, and this just means that the Hamiltonian is conserved. So that's all that, that, that the additional equation of motion is expressing. Uh, with this upper and lower index formalism, we can now take this new Lagrangian we've written down with that minus sign and recast it as literally a, uh, a, a, uh, a Lorentz invariant lookalike inner product. Um, by raising this index here, we account for the minus sign. Uh, and we end up with uh, a construction that involves a generalization of the Minkowski metric. But now where the plus ones, uh, they label all the different degrees of freedom, even if there are infinitely many of them. So we get this uh, repair metrization invariant or uh, equivalently manifestly covariate looking Lagrangian formulation. Uh, what's nice about this is, is not only do we, do we single out something that looks kind of like a Minkowski metric, but we can see right from this Lagrangian that a special, um, that, that uh, a special category of systems will be singled out, systems that have uh, a symmetry under which we replace um, all of our degrees of freedom in their canonical momenta with 
a matrix multiplied by, by, by those quantities where this matrix obeys the standard invariance property um, that it leaves the Minkowski metric invariant. So this generalizes Lorentz symmetry, again, you know, without any assumption that these degrees of freedom ultimately have something to do with space. So that's interesting in and of itself. Uh, I will be applying this, however, to um, to systems in space-time in a moment. So we won't need the, the most general formulation of this, but 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 this language will be useful for our work ahead, which is why I introduced it. Let me talk now about uh, Wigner's classification. Um, so the, the starting point here is the Poincaré group. These are the natural uh, symmetries of space-time. Um, these symmetries involve translations, where we take a space-time coordinate. Uh, and we shift it by an additive constant, uh, an additive constant four vector, which you think of as shifting the space-time origin um, by some fixed amount, a mu. Uh, we also have Lorentz transformations, uh, which I presented before in its generalized sense, but this is your usual Lorentz transformations um, that, uh, that leave the invariant space-time interval alone. Um, we take these, these transformations, um, and the idea is we want to ask what kinds of, what are the minimal kinds of physical systems uh, for which these transformations make sense, uh, and for which we can we can uh, think of the system as kind of an irreducible whole, where we we all the different states of the system are related by some by 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 one of these transformations, uh, and this this turns out to provide a very beautiful classification for what kinds of of elementary systems there are. Um, uh, the quantum case uh, is I guess historically came first. Um, and, uh, and so the question is, what are the most basic quantum systems on which we can implement these kinds of transformations? Uh, Wigner provided a, a very nice answer in 1939. Qu quantum systems, one can think of them as being uh, characterized by a particular Hilbert space. Um, and in particular, we want that Hilbert space, that collection of that, that set of all the quantum states of the system um, to, to admit uh, the action of, of these Poincaré transformations in the sense of unitary operators. So given a pair, uh, A, a, a constant translation of origin, and lambda, a Lorentz transformation matrix, um, we need some unitary operator uh, that represents this pair uh, as uh, a, a unitary operator that acts on the states that make up our Hilbert space. We need the Hilbert space to be closed in the sense that um, uh, if we act on arbitrary states of the Hilbert space, we don't leave the Hilbert space. We always end up with some state in the Hilbert space. And we want this to be irreducible uh, in the sense that we can get from any one state to any other state. There are no other states beyond those that can be reached through these transformations. You know, the example I sometimes give is like, uh, you know, if you have uh, an electron and a chicken, you don't want those to be in the same irreducible representation because you can't do a Lorentz transformation to turn an electron into a chicken. We exclude any states that cannot be reached through rotations, translations, or Lorentz boosts, and those should give us all the different states of what we call one irreducible elementary system, like an electron. Um, once you introduce these unitary operators, you study their, um, uh, their infinitesimal uh, um, uh, 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 cases, you consider infinitesimal transformations. Um, and from this, you get translation generators, which, uh, which are operators that are interpreted as, as the operators whose eigenvalues describe form momentum. Um, the uh, operators that generate rotations and, and Lorentz boosts comprise the Lorentz generators, whose uh, interpretation observably is, is, uh, is angular momentum, uh, and, and, and also a somewhat more esoteric um, uh, uh, observable that describes translational behavior of the center of mass of the system. Um, other things you can you can build out of these objects uh, that are important to the pali lubansky pseudo vector, which which will play a role in our work ahead. And here I'm using um, conventions where the anti-symmetric Levi-Civita symbol, which is used to construct the pali lubansky pseudo vector and other quantities that will be important to us, is defined when all of its indices are, are down in the order t x y z is plus one and is otherwise completely anti-symmetric on um, uh, interchanges of his indices. Uh, we can raise and lower indices on the levi civita symbol like we can with other uh, Lorentz tensors. Uh, and in this convention, there's an overall minus sign when you raise all the indices. So again, this is, this is the quantum case. Hilbert, um, um, Wigner, uh, um, you know, did the analysis for the quantum case. He studied what are the minimal Hilbert spaces uh, that provide irreducible um, unitary representations of the Poincaré group. Um, and he found that, that the different possibilities were classified by, by fixed values of certain properties called Casimir invariants. These are things that don't change when you do Poincaré transformations. And so a system can only have one specific value of these. You can't change the value by any Lorentz transformation, so you can't include a state uh, that has a different value of one of these invariants. That state would, um, would necessarily not be in the same irreducible representation. So these quantities are mass squared. 
which is real valued, not quantized, uh, intrinsic spin, which is quantized, uh, and any additional charges that basically commute with unitary operators that carry out Lorentz transformations. These are charges that are basically Lorentz invariant properties, like electric charge. Uh, some of these are quantized, some of them are not, depending on, on, on what particular property we're talking about. All right, so we see that these, these uh, properties that, that characterize a single irreducible unitary representation, these are exactly what you would say describe a single quantum particle of a single particle type. It's characterized by a mass squared at intrinsic spin and charge. Uh, and these are the only possibilities. This is a classification of what kinds of elementary systems there can be. Right, so this is a, a basically a complete chart. What are the kinds of quantum particles you can have? The mass squared can be positive, zero, or negative. Um, the uh, uh, time-like component of the form momentum uh, uh, can be positive or negative. Uh, in the case where the mass squared is positive or zero, um, there's a simple argument that the time-like component PT of the form momentum is Lorentz invariant, so it has a well-defined sign. Um, if mass squared is positive, then you can, in a well-defined way, declare that PT, the time-like component of the formatum, is always positive. Uh, and then this first example would correspond to a positive energy, because PT has the interpretation of the uh, energy of the system. Massive particle, m squared is, is positive, so we call this a massive particle. And we have other cases as well. Uh, in particular, uh, we'll see that the tachyons sort of uh, uh, provide a, 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 a counterexample to this, this story. Uh, tachyons are characterized by a negative value of m squared. Essentially, they have an imaginary mass. And so the, the theorem that the sign of the time-like component of the formentum is Lorentz invariant does not hold. Tachyons do not have a well-defined energy. Um, spin, however, uh, is quantized. We have integer, uh, the, the integer cases that, that ultimately describe bosons, half integer cases that describe fermions. What's nice about this picture is um, you can consider multi-particle uh, systems going beyond just one particle to quantum systems that can consist of arbitrary numbers of particles. This is the Fock representation of a multi-particle system. And then you can construct uh, 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 coherent states, which generalize the kind of coherent states one sees for like a harmonic oscillator. Um, you can consider states of no particle, one particle, two particles superposed in just the right way that you get monochromatic plane waves like macroscopic looking monochromatic plane waves that then give rise to various classical field theories. Uh, and so this classification of particle types leads to a classification of force field theories. For example, massive spin one leads to Yukawa field, massless spin one, uh, massless spin zero, massive spin zero corresponds to Yukawa field, massless spin one corresponds to like a gauge field, like the electromagnetic field um, or non-abelian gauge theories. Massless spin two leads to the gravitational field and you can go directly from this classification of particles to the kinds of force field theories that you can have, at least for bosons, for which coherent states make sense. Okay, so that's a really beautiful picture. There's a classical analog of that picture. Uh, it goes back several decades. Um, it's known in some quarters as the method of cojoint orbits and the mathematics can get very arcane. I'll take a much more pedestrian approach here. To summarize, uh, at the level of words, we're going to take the words that characterize the Wigner approach for the quantum case and replace them with their corresponding classical counterparts. Uh, irreducible is going to become transitive. It has the same meaning that we can get from any state of the system to any other state uh, through one of these transformations. So we have a, a like a, 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 a you know self-contained most elementary possible system. Uh, unitary. Uh, which made sense in the context of, of quantum Hilbert spaces will become symplectomorphic, which is just a fancy way of saying that it, it preserves the uh, symplectic form that, 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 that we use to characterize uh, Hamiltonian dynamics in the classical case. Representation is the appropriate word to use for uh, groups acting on, on, on vector spaces. Here we have groups acting on phase spaces. Uh, so we'll just call that a group action. Okay? It's not going to be called a representation. But, but there really is this sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between these terms. Okay, so um, there's a natural group action, the Poincaré group, on a particular phase space. Uh, now, one can make this a more rigorous argument, but for, for our purposes, I'll keep this, like I said, pedestrian. The, the most natural kind of phase space on which you can act has some label X that responds to the uh, Poincaré transformations in the standard way. There's corresponding canonical momentum P. Uh, but to be as general as possible, we'll include uh, an additional label that responds non-trivially to Lorentz transformations. So that even if X and P are somehow fixed, there's this other label that in principle can change. Um, this is gonna be how we're gonna represent the Poincaré group acting on these states of the phase space. X transforms the way you'd expect. Uh, in, in, under a general uh, Poincaré transformation, there's a Lorentz transformation plus uh, a translation in space of origin. 
the momentum transforms by Lorentz transformation, and this other uh, label um, transforms uh, in the so-called adjoint representation. Uh, it transforms as lambda s lambda transpose. So we have space-time degrees of freedom, we have formentum, and we'll see that this additional uh, uh, this additional label that we've allowed the system to have, um, we, we could have ignored it, but then we wouldn't be as as general as we are now. We'll see that this thing naturally accounts for and describes uh, spin. So unlike in the quantum case, now they're doing phase spaces, unlike Hilbert spaces, uh, our states are labeled by both X and P. X and P simultaneously are well-defined. However, like in the quantum case, we're allowing for an anti-symmetric tensor that we'll see uh, uh, encodes intrinsic spin. But as in the quantum case, we'll see the spin does not literally refer to anything spinning or rotating, and yet it still makes sense. All right, so we're looking for a transitive group action. Every state should be reached from any other state by some group transformation. Uh, so one approach to, to doing this is to pick a convenient reference state and then define the full phase space by acting on it with arbitrary point create transformations. In this way, we'll generate every possible state that you can get and all these states will be connected to each other through point create transformations. So we'll be including just all the states we need and no states beyond those that can be reached by point create transformations. In general, I'll take the reference uh, space-time coordinate value to be zero. That'll be a general thing that I'll impose on the reference state. We'll see that the reference values of momentum and, and spin, uh, we'll need to pick those on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so then again, by the transitivity assumption, we can express all states starting from this reference state, where again, I'm taking my reference space-time coordinate value to be zero, and the momentum and, and spin to be uh, things I'll pick on a case-by-case -case basis. And under a completely arbitrary point create transformation, we end up with this state. And this is how we're gonna parametrize all the possible states of the phase space. We can now treat A, this four vector that describes a shift of space-time origin. Uh, we can treat that as one of our variables now that labels the states of our phase space. Uh, to connect it more with, with space-time again, I'll refer to it as capital X. And then lambda mu nu, which is our boost variable, which represents an arbitrary boost from a reference state that connects us to the other states of our system. We will now treat big X and lambda as our fundamental phase space variables. And now we can label all the states of our phase space in this way. This makes explicit uh, that X and lambda are our basic variables and expresses everything in terms of those variables and our reference values of the full momentum and the spin. We can now introduce some natural tensors uh, that describe various observables of interest. There is an angular momentum tensor, which is xp minus uh, uh, px, essentially. This is the relativistic generalization of angular momentum is r cross p, the standard formula for angular momentum. Uh, we can combine this anti-symmetric uh, tensor describing angular momentum with our spin tensor uh, to define um, an overall angular momentum. In a little bit, I'll justify why it is indeed fair to think of s mu nu as, as describing angular momentum. Uh, but with that assumption, we can combine these things to define the total length of momentum of our system. I'm going to give names to the various components of these uh, anti-symmetric tensors in the following way. Um, the uh, space, spatial components of the J tensor will describe, um, uh, will, will, will encode a, uh, a three vector. Uh, this is going to ultimately be the angular momentum three vector. And then we have these K vectors here. In the quantum case, or in the case we think of angular momentum as, as, as being generators of transformations, the Js are angular momentum uh, operators, which, which correspond to rotation generators, and the Ks are the generators of boosts. We'll do a similar decomposition, uh, similar labeling scheme for the components of the spin tensor. Um, I, I'm running out of letters here, so I'll just use S with a single index to refer to the spatial parts, and S with a tilde on it to refer to the time components. With these definitions, I can uh, write out the pauli lebansky pseudo vector. Uh, it's usually defined with total angular momentum here, but in, it, because X and P are simultaneously defined in the classical case, um, and there's a P already in this formula, uh, the uh, contribution from orbital angular momentum cancels due to symmetry anti-symmetry, um, and, uh, and we're left with just the spin part, and I can now write this out explicitly in terms of the various three vectors here. So this is a three vector formula for the pauli lebansky vector. It's not particularly intuitive, but, but there it is. Just like in the quantum case, uh, classical systems with phase spaces that provide uh, transitive um, group actions um, of the Poincaré group are characterized by certain Casimir invariants. These are things that cannot change under Poincaré transformations. And so a single transitive group action uh, has to be characterized by an invariant value of one of these things. And these correspond very neatly to the quantum case. There's a mass squared, which corresponds to p dot p. This is a thing that is Lorentz invariant. 
uh, fully point grain variant and therefore has a well-defined single value uh, for such a system. Um, there's the squared pali lebansky uh, vector. Uh, there's the squared spin where we take the spin tensor and we contract all of its indices together twice. Written in terms of three vectors, this becomes this spin three vector squared minus this, uh, this, this uh, time-like part of the spin tensor three vector squared. Uh, we can also uh, contract the spin tensor twice with the levi civita symbol, and this turns into S dot S tilde. Now, it's worth pointing out here that the fact that little s squared here is invariant, that's this thing over here, s mu nu dot into s mu nu, this is a Poincaré invariant quantity. So it, ha it just has an invariant value for any transitive group action of the Poincaré group. It's invariant just in the same sense that m squared is invariant. Right, so quant is this is the first like theoretical result that I I, I um, alluded to at the beginning. The fact that s squared is an invariant has nothing more to do with quantization than the fact that m squared is invariant. In this classical case, uh, s is not quantized at all. Um, there is no condition here that s be quantized. Um, if you wanted to connect this with the quantum case, you could say that we're working here in the limit of, for example, a particle with a very large amount of intrinsic spin, an amount of intrinsic spin that's very large compared with h bar. So the quantization of spin is now um, is now negligible, uh, but the particle still has an intrinsic spin that's some fixed property of the particle, and and so you can see from this other perspective why you can have uh, a fixed value of intrinsic spin without uh, any noticeable quantization. If you're worried at all about spin not being quantized and what this might, uh, whether this comes into conflict with the spin statistics theorem, not to worry. Uh, again, we're working in a limit where, uh, where there's no spin quantization. Uh, and in particular, um, you're not gonna ever have two particles that are exactly in the same classical state. Um, so quantum statistics here is irrelevant. We don't have to worry about bosons and fermions. Okay, so now that we, we've laid that groundwork, the, this is again, the classical counterpart of Wigner's construction. We now have a classical classification of the different kinds of particle, um, uh, particle types that one can have, including the possibility of spin. Um, you can think of that as all like the kinematical side. Now for the dynamical side, the laws of physics for the system, how do we write down an action functional that, that includes spin and describes its dynamics? Well, we start with the appropriately manifestly covariant action functional without spin. Uh, and this formula is completely dictated. This is just a carbon copy of the manifestly covariant um, reparameterization uh, uh, invariant action that I wrote down way at the beginning. Um, our degrees of freedom here are the x's. We have the p's. So this is literally just a recasting of what I wrote before. We're, this is forced upon us by our assumption this thing has a Lagrangian description. In this next formula here, I've made explicit uh, the fact that the fundamental variables here are x and lambda. Uh, the full momentum is, is literally lambda times P0, where P0 is the reference, the fixed constant reference value of the full momentum that we're using to define all the states of our system. And I should uh, emphasize here uh, that although this is, I'm saying this is full momentum and this is, this uh, X dot is a, a derivative with respect to our lambda parameter of space-time uh, coordinates, I am not here asserting any definite relationship between uh, these two four vectors, X dot and P. Um, we'll ultimately see that the relationship between them emerges from the dynamics. We'll see that the fact that uh, four velocity, which is basically x dot mu, is proportional to four momentum, as one would expect, is going to have to be a thing that emerges. It's not something we're going to dictate at this point. So how do we introduce spin? Well, we look at this action we have here. This is written in terms of manifestly translational degrees of freedom, translational space-time degrees of freedom, and linear momentum. And we just do a trick. We, we do um, a, 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 a set of changes of, of, of variables. Um, ultimately, we, we, we rewrite uh, this quantity here with lambda over here. Uh, we, we, we rewrite things in terms of the orbital angular momentum uh, tensor. Uh, when you rewrite things in this way, you get a formula that looks like this. There are some boundary terms that show up from some integration by parts that, that you do uh, at, at intermediate stages of this calculation. Boundary terms ultimately will not have any effect on the dynamics and the equations of motion that come out of this action so that we could ignore them. Now you might be surprised that we can take a translational action, an action describing translational degrees of freedom and recast it in terms of what looked like purely rotational degrees of freedom. But remember, this is not just angular momentum. L mu nu has spatial parts that describe angular momentum, but also time parts uh, that actually describe translational motion. 
So this thing contains both translational and rotational uh, dynamics in it. It really does uh, capture all the features of the system. And again, it has to because this is just a simple rewriting of the action we had before in terms of, of the angular momentum tensor. The one half automatically shows up in the middle of the calculation, which is very nice. This eliminates double counting because uh, these are anti-symmetric tensors and without the one half, we would be double counting. And theta dot here uh, is the analog for uh, angular momentum and boosts, what x dot is for uh, linear momentum. Uh, it's, uh, it's a set of rates, but not rates of translational degrees of freedom. It's, race, uh, it's, it's boost rates and angular speeds. There's an explicit formula over here that just comes, comes out when you're actually going through this, the steps of doing this rewriting of the action. Uh, what you find is that theta dot is given explicitly by this formula where the sigma mu nus are the standard Lorentz generators, uh, just expressed as, as matrices. So all this just automatically comes out. This is not put in by hand. This is just rewriting the action we started before, uh, and we get this. But now that we have the action in this form, uh, it's very natural to include spin. Um, we just take L mu nu that was showing up in that action, and we replace it with L mu nu plus S mu nu. Um, so that's like the, the, the most canonical way to, to do this. Uh, um, L mu nu now becomes J mu nu, which we can, uh, we can expand in terms of L mu nu and S mu nu over here. It's convenient to take these two terms and to take the first term, the term involving L, and rewrite it back in its original form in terms of translational degrees of freedom, like I have over here. I'm ignoring boundary terms in this expression. Uh, then we take the spin part and write the spin part explicitly uh, in terms of uh, this matrix trace that has shown up in the, the boost and, and rotation rates. Write it out like this. And we end up with uh, this is our action functional. So again, just to summarize, we started with just the the action functional describing a particle without spin with just translation degrees of freedom. We recast that action in terms of angular momentum and boost variables. Uh, then we naturally took the L mu nu, the angular momentum boost tensor. We generalized it to include spin. And then we just rewrote things back in their original form and just made explicit the dependence here on the lambda boost variables. Here I've made explicit that our action depends uh, on uh, the fundamental variables of our sp phase space, these translational space-time degrees of freedom, uh, and this lambda, this boost degree of freedom. All right, we have an action, and it includes spin. We can vary the action with respect to our fundamental variables, x and lambda. Varying with respect to x gives us momentum conservation. Varying with respect to lambda gives us conservation of the uh, angular momentum and boost variables. This is not a surprise. This is, after all, a free particle. Uh, also, Noether's theorem applies because this action has translational and rotational and boost symmetries. So we expect these conservation laws to show up. Uh, you can show directly from these equations of motion that uh, the pauli lubansky vector has vanishing uh, time derivative. And this ensures uh, that at least the first couple of uh, Casimir invariants are constant as required. M squared and W squared. W squared is the pauli lubansky vector squared. These are automatically guaranteed to be constant. We don't have to do any work there. However, the invariance of the spin squared, okay, which again is S mu nu times S mu nu, S contracted with itself quadratically, um, that defines another invariant property that has to have a constant value on the phase space to give a transitive uh, group action. Uh, that turns out to still be non-trivial. If we require that it be constant and we take its derivative with respect to our parameter, this turns into the following phase space condition. This is a condition that's expressed solely in terms of phase space variables, p mu and s mu nu. This has to vanish in order for s squared to be invariant as required. Uh, and this will turn out to be an extremely important and powerful condition. It was first written down in 1981 by Sager, Scam, and Stern. And it is a, the very natural, it's a natural a classical uh, counterpart to uh, an equation that shows up in classical and quantum field theory, the Lorenz equation that shows up for Proca fields and also when working in electromagnetism and Lorenz gauge with the, the canonical uh, relationship between uh, the Fourier space relationship between uh, partial derivatives of the space-time variables and, uh, and formal momentum. Um, and in fact, this condition we'll see in the, in the box here for the classical case acting on the, this, the uh, phase space of our classical system will, it will turn out to serve a role that is very analogous to the role that Lorenz equation plays for field theory. It eliminates on physical spin states. We'll see that this does exactly the same job. One can, by the way, make this even more explicit if one goes, uh, and if we have time at the end or maybe in the discussion, I'll talk about how one can make this correspondence even more, uh, even more direct. Okay, so this phase space condition that we're imposing implies if you take its derivative with respect to the, the parameter uh, lambda implies a, a subsidiary condition. And this condition 
when you work it out in various cases, will ultimately give us the relationship between x dot mu and p mu. And for example, in the standard cases show that p mu is parallel to x dot mu, formentum is parallel to four velocity as one would expect. There's some additional conditions that we need to check on a case by case basis, but they won't be of enormous theoretical significance. So if we specialized at a proper orthochronous Poincaré transformations, uh, proper means that we do not consider parity transformations. We don't consider discrete transformations, only uh, uh, rotations that are smoothly related to the identity rotation. And orthochronous means we don't, uh, we're not gonna be considering discrete time reversal transformations. We get what's called the proper orthochronous Poincaré group. Uh, again, this is what one also does in the quantum uh, Wigner case. And then we get a classification that completely parallels the Wigner classification, the allowed values of M squared, the allowed values of PT. Again, just keep in mind, we're dealing with free particles here. Okay, let's now apply this classification. Let's look at some key cases. So the, the first most obvious key case is massive positive energy where M squared is positive. When uh, M squared, which is negative P squared uh, is, is positive, the formentum is, is, uh, is time-like. Um, there's a very simple argument. This again means that the time-like component of the formentum, which describes the energy of the, of the system, uh, is uh, Lorentz invariant, at least its sign is Lorentz invariant. So we can consistently take that sign to be positive, interpret that as the energy of the system. Uh, and so we see we're describing here a massive positive energy particle. Um, these conditions permit us to choose uh, our reference formentum, again, this is the formentum that defines our reference state from which all the other states in the phase space are related by acting with Poincaré transformations. We can take that to be a, a, a state that's purely time-like. This will ultimately describe a particle at rest. Um, then uh, uh, taking this uh, formula here, um, uh, taking the formulas above, we can write down the, the, the standard master relation that relates the energy of the system to the uh, system's three momentum and its, uh, and its mass. This subsidiary condition that I promised would give us a relationship between formentum and four velocity does in fact do that. The relationship that one gets from this is that P mu is equal to M times U mu, where U mu is the properly normalized four velocity. Um, here we're taking uh, derivative with respect to lambda. When you take derivative with respect to an arbitrary uh, parameter lambda, there's no guarantee that the square of this four vector has the correct normalization. Uh, but when you actually do this calculation, you get the properly normalized uh, four velocity. If you replace lambda, the arbitrary parameter lambda, with the proper time of the system, uh, then this square root goes away and you just get the standard formula that u, the four velocity, is dx d tau. Um, so we get the standard relationship between four momentum and four velocity as expected. Uh, you can then you know, play around with some algebra and derive that the velocity uh, of, of this particle is given by the ratio of its uh, spatial three momentum to its energy. Uh, and then using the master relationship, you find that that's P over the square root of P squared plus M squared, which implies that the norm of the three velocity is always less than one. This is a particle that always travels slower than light. So this exactly describes what you think of as a massive particle. What about spin? We still have to impose this phase space condition. When you impose it, uh, what you find is that in the reference, the rest state of the, of the particle, all the time-like parts of the spin tensor are annihilated and we're left just with the usual uh, spin three vector. So the particle in its rest state just has some three vector describing, uh, describing its spin, actually a pseudo vector, but, but a vector pointing in a purely space-like direction. It's straightforward to show that that spin squared invariant is just the three-dimensional norm squared of the spin vector. Uh, you can also calculate explicitly what the pauli lubansky vector squared is in these other quantities. You get these formulas. Now, there's a, a, a crucial thing we have to talk about, which is uh, what does the phase space look like at a uh, fixed uh, formentum? So if I fix the formant of the particle and just ask, you know, for example, in the particle's rest state, uh, how big is the phase space in that rest, in, in, in that rest frame? Um, well, that's going to be determined what's called the little group, the little group of the Poincaré group for that uh, formentum. Uh, that is, the so little group is the set of all transformations of a group that leave uh, a particular thing they're acting on invariant. Um, if we want to know how big is the phase space of states that all share the same formant and that all share the same energy, we want to ask what are all of the Poincaré transformations that leave that full momentum unchanged. Uh, that's again, it's called the little group. Uh, and if we go to the reference state of the particle where the, for, where the full momentum is purely time-like, um, 
well, then this group is just the set of all rotations. We can do any rotation we want on that state. It leaves this formentum unchanged. This parametrizes the set of all the states in the phase space that share that same form momentum. And that's just the usual group of 3D rotations. And that's a compact group. It's closed and bounded. You know, it forms a closed and bounded set. And this is good because unbounded phase spaces uh, uh, lead to infinitely large macro states. If you try to coarse grain a phase space in some equitable fashion and you have an unbounded uh, phase space, then you can end up with things like infinite entropy and other poor thermodynamic behavior. Um, and, and in particular, because this is the phase space at fixed formentum and fixed energy, it is very good that once we fix the energy, we don't get infinite entropies for a single particle. There are other pathologies that show up if one tries to treat these systems quantum field theoretically as well. Although there are some promising results uh, in the past couple of years that one can actually do some interesting things with these systems, but I'll leave that aside. We can also study the massless case. So again, we go back to, to the, uh, the Casimir invariant m squared. Here we set equal to zero. We're still able consistently to set the sign of the energy to be positive. Here we cannot set the reference for momentum to describe uh, a system at rest because that is incompatible with p squared being zero. The simplest we can do is we can set the z component, the, the third spatial component to be equal to the time-like component. The subsidiary condition once again gives us that the formentum is parallel to the four velocity, although we cannot normalize because these things have vanishing norm squared. Uh, if one computes the velocity of this system, one finds that the speed is one, which in our, our units is the speed of light. What about spin? This time the phase space condition is less trivial. Uh, it, it implies that the Z component of the time part of the spin tensor vanishes, but it doesn't tell us that the other components of the time part of the spin tensor vanish. Instead, all we get is that certain linear combinations vanish. And this means that the reference spin tensor in its simplest form takes this uh, representation here. This is more complicated than the massive case. We have non-zero entries in the X and Y components. Again, I've singled out the X and Y components because my reference formentum singled out the Z component. That's why the X and Y components are singled out over here. We naturally introduced the helicity. The helicity is the normalized three momentum dotted into the uh, spatial part of the uh, spin tensor. Uh, this is the spin vector. Um, and one can check that this quantity is invariant under proper orthochronous point Poincaré transformations. So it, as long as we stick to those kinds of point Poincaré, trans, tra, Poincaré transformations, the helicity is another invariant property of the phase space. It does flip sign if we allow parity transformations. It's straightforward to do some calculations here, show that the spin squared of the system is just the Z component squared and is, is equal to the helicity squared. The Pauli-Lebansky vector vanishes, the, the square of the Pauli-Lebansky vector vanishes. Um, this other quantity here vanishes. If we now ask the same question about uh, the size of the phase space at fixed formentum, we fix the formentum and just ask how big is the phase space of states that share that same formentum and in particular share the same energy, um, we run into some trouble. There's a, a somewhat more complicated group of point Poincaré transformations that leave that reference formentum fixed. These involve rotations on the z-axis. That's fine. Those are compact. But we also get an unbounded set of Lorentz transformations. These are a complicated mixture of Lorentz boost Lorentz transformation. Uh, that are unbounded because they involve Lorentz boosts, but, but they, they leave that formentum fixed. And so we naively get a, a, an unbounded set of states in our phase space that share the same formentum and share the same energy. We run into the thermodynamic problems that we had before. Um, so this is, this is well known. It goes back many, many years. Th these transformations form the non-compact group ISO2. Um, and, and what's even worse is that both of these transformations act non-trivially on the spin tensor. So they really are giving you seemingly different states. This is not, these aren't just transformations that leave the formentum invariant. They change something about the particle, even at fixed formentum, they change its spin tensor. So we really do have a problem here. In the quantum case, we can eliminate them by doing a certain kind of projection. We can't do that in the classical case because we don't have a Hilbert space or operators. So what we do is we impose an equivalence relation. We take the phase space of the system of the massless particle, this is a new result, and we impose a, a, a very simple equivalence relation. We declare that two states that share the same X and the same P are to be identified as the same state, full stop. Because of the invariance of the helicity, which is proportional to P dot S, um, uh, we don't have to worry about whether we're uh, equating states that have different helicities. These states, uh, automatically have the same helicity. And we're basically declaring that, that, that if they have what look like different spin tensors, we're just going to identify them as being the same physical state. This equivalence relation, as you can check, renders the non-compact part, the, the, those 
Lorentz boosts uh, that led to this unbounded uh, phase space at fixed energy, one can show that that now disappears that those uh, Lorentz transformations simply take us from these states to these states, and because we're physically identifying them, that unbounded part of the phase space goes away. This equivalence relation is very closely related to the standard uh, gauge equivalence relation of electromagnetism. So we see already the level of a single classical massless point particle, the emergence of something uh, totally analogous to electromagnetic gauge invariance. Obviously, all physical observables have to be gauge invariant because these don't represent different states now. So all observables have to respect this equivalence. One can check that all the observables I've written down are indeed gauge invariant, and that will be required of all, uh, of all uh, other observables as well. Just as an aside, one can also consider tachyons. What one finds for tachyons with negative mass squared, the sign of the energy is no longer well-defined. Uh, the simplest uh, formatum you can take looks like this. That's purely space-like. Uh, if you calculate speed, you find it's bigger than one. Um, if you try to calculate little group in this case, you find that it's unbounded again, and there is no clever way to eliminate the unboundedness. So we simply have to set the spin equal to zero. And this provides a very neat explanation for why tachyons are naturally spinless. Okay, so we considered the massless case, and we saw that we could impose this equivalence relation. Is there a natural way to see this equivalence relation emerge in some uh, massless limit of the massive case? And the answer is yes. And this is just the Higgs mechanism in reverse. We'll reverse this argument in a moment and see how the Higgs mechanism shows up. So how do we start with the massive case and end up in the massless case? We start back in the massive case again. Unfortunately, we can't start with the original reference formantum because it doesn't behave very nicely and the limit m goes to zero. We would end up with just a totally uh, vanishing formantum, which is not what we want. Now, we can choose uh, any formantum that we want that's connected to this formantum and, and satisfies p squared equals negative m squared is positive. We can pick any formantum we want because it's a transitive representation. They're all connected by Lorentz transformations. So we'll pick this one instead. This is a different choice of reference formantum for the massive case where p bar t is related to p bar z by this formula here. This ensures that p squared is equal to negative m squared as required. Okay. Now the massless limit is perfectly fine. If we take the massless limit, what we get back is exactly the standard massless reference formantum. Now our original massive reference formantum and this new one that we've just introduced, they are again related by a Lorentz transformation. I'll call that Lorentz transformation. Lorentz transformation lambda bar. We can use lambda bar to figure out what the new reference spin tensor is. It's still in the massive case. And what we find is that although the new reference formantum has a nice mass, massless limit, the, the corresponding new reference spin does not. There are components that are singular in that limit. Furthermore, if you compute the spin squared in the massive case, you get too much spin. You get spin coming from the X and Y components that are not present in the massless case. So we're seeing singular behavior in spin and we're also seeing additional spin that, that is present in the massive case that does not go away properly in the massless case. There is a trick that we can borrow from quantum field theory, the Suckelberg construction, which goes all the way back to the 30s. Uh, I'm just gonna translate this trick directly into classical point particle language. So all of the steps I'm gonna take now uh, are just counterparts of what we do in the quantum case. We start by doing a redefinition of our uh, X and Y components of spin. This is the, the redefinition. This redefinition involves the introduction of two arbitrary uh, variables, phi X and phi Y, that are arbitrary functions of our world line parameter lambda. And now the system has an emergent gauge invariance. We can transform the S's and the phi's in compensating ways that leave all the physical features of the system unchanged. With these redefinitions, we uh, the uh, new uh, spin that we, that, that, that uh, the new formula for the spin tensor breaks up into terms that have the correct massless limit and a bunch of terms that depend on these new phi uh, functions. The spin squared now looks like this. We have the spin z part squared, which is what we want in the massless limit, and the spin x and spin y terms that we don't want have a prefactor that looks like this, and this prefactor goes away in the massless limit. So now the massless limit works properly. After taking m goes to zero, we're welcome to decouple these additional degrees of freedom, phi x and phi y, by setting them equal to zero. And then we're left with the phase space precisely of a massless particle. If we go in reverse, switch these fields back on again and recombine them into the spin tensor, we can undo the, mass, the massless limit. And this, this is literally the Higgs mechanism, right? This is the classical counterpart of the Higgs mechanism. So the remaining time, I'm going to do uh, a couple of applications of this stuff. So that was all theory. 
um, we can use this to, 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 to derive some interesting results about the behavior of, of charged particles. I'm going to specialize now to, to the case of a massive particle with charge. I'm going to couple it to an electromagnetic field, and we'll be able to derive a, a new law of physics, a modified Lorentz force law for this particle. And in particular, we'll see that magnetic forces can, uh, in, in, um, uh, contra uh, claims made by some textbooks, do work. OK, so again, we're specialized into the massive case. We're going to introduce a charge Q. This is just electric charge. I call it electric monopole charge to distinguish it from dipole charge. There's also going to be an elementary dipole tensor. That's just an antisymmetric tensor that encodes uh, electric and dipole moments. They naturally form uh, a rank two antisymmetric tensor that I'll write down in a moment. I'll write it down now. OK, good. So you can take this tensor and you can decompose it into electric and magnetic parts. These electromagnetic parts can further be decomposed into uh, uh, a, an electric dipole four vector pi mu and a magnetic dipole vector mu. Um, how does this look like in terms of tensors? Well, if I take m u nu and I write it as a totally anti-symmetric tensor, I write it out as a matrix, then the pi's show up in the spatial parts. I'm sorry, the pi's show up in the time parts and the mu's show up in the spatial parts. This is just a formal decomposition that's totally analogous to taking angular momentum and decomposing it into the j parts that are the spatial parts. That's analogous to mu. And then the time parts, those are, uh, uh, in the angular momentum, those would be the, the K, the, the boost variables. Those correspond to the electric parts. These four vectors are nothing other than going to the rest frame of the particle, where we just have uh, a pi zero, a three vector describing a, uh, an electric dipole moment vector, and mu zero describing a magnetic dipole moment uh, uh, three vector. And we're just boosting them to an arbitrary frame using our Lorentz boost variable lambda, the particles Lorentz boost variable lambda. So these four vectors, the four vector electric dipole moment and the four vector magnetic dipole moment are just boosting the standard three vector describing electric and dipole moment in the particle's rest frame to an arbitrary frame. Okay, the particle has a current density, current density, the total current density, its response uh, to electromagnetic fields and its sourcing of electromagnetic fields consists of an electric part and a dipole part. This dipole part is dictated by Lorentz symmetry. It has to have this form. Um, if we introduce the four velocity of the particle, the standard Lorentz factor gamma, your one over one over the square root of one minus V squared over C squared, where C is one, uh, and the standard formula for a Lorentz invariant generalization of the 3D delta function, then I can write down explicit formulas for the electric charge density here. This is a point-like particle, so it's got a delta function at its location X, um, and it's got electric charge Q. Uh, uh, the magnetic dipole density is related to the dipole tensor of the particle in this way. It's very analogous to the electric charge density. Now I can just write down the action. I have the action from before. This was my relativistic uh, action I wrote way back before. That's just determined by the group theoretic properties of a massive particle with spin. This term is the standard Maxwell action. And this is the standard coupling between a current density and the gauge potential. So this is just the standard action you'd write down for a particle coupled to the electromagnetic field, except that now the particle has spin. Okay. Here, the Faraday tensor is related to the gauge potential in the standard way. You can derive the equations of motion. You get the standard Maxwell equations. These are the usual Maxwell equations in Lorentz covariant form. We do some integration by parts, and then we can derive equations of motion for x and for lambda. You do the derive the equation of motion for the x uh, space-time degrees of freedom of the particle, and you get a generalization of Lorentz force law that includes the usual part. This is your usual E plus V cross B part when written out in three-vector notation. And you also get a bunch of new terms that describe the direct coupling between the electromagnetic field and the electric and magnetic dipole moments of the particle. Okay. Um, these are results that generalize earlier results um, that go back to the 80s. Uh, those results uh, did not include a, um, uh, those results did not include electric dipole moments. Uh, we all, uh, like I said, you also derive the equation of motion that comes from the other um, uh, phase space variable lambda, uh, and this gives you another equation of motion. This uh, likewise generalizes earlier results that go back to the 1950s. Um, these generalized results describing spin precession. Okay, um, so if we take the non-relativistic limit, what comes out is the usual Lorentz force law, your QE plus V cross B, plus some new terms. And these new terms feature electric and magnetic dipole moments showing up on a completely equal footing. Um, you can compute the space-like uh, part of the Lorentz force law and the time-like part. The time-like part just expresses power or rate of which energy is done. They're completely compatible with each other. We see in particular that 
Uh, the electric and, and magnetic dipole moments appear in a completely equal footing. They both do work, uh, at least magnetic, uh, electric and magnetic fields both do work in a completely uh, uh, equitable way. And so we see very explicitly that a particle with an intrinsic magnetic dipole moment indeed can have work done on a bimagnetic field. One other new result is if you uh, impose constancy of spin squared for the system, you get a relation between the spin tensor and the dipole tensor. If you recast this in three vector language, it just tells you that in the rest frame of the particle, the three vectors describing electric and magnetic dipole moment must be collinear with the particle spin. Up until this point, we had no idea which way the electric and magnetic dipole moment vectors were pointing. But a consistency condition that comes right out is that they have to be collinear with each other and with the spin. Intuitively, this makes sense. If they were not collinear with spin, electromagnetic forces could exert torques that could speed up or spin down the particle. But this lets us see explicitly why, even once we've included electromagnetic interactions, the particle's spin does not change. Because the dipole moments are collinear with the spin, interactions with electromagnetic field will not spin up or spin down the particle. This is really all compatible with the particle spin, as we've said up until this point, being invariant, even in the absence of quantization. In quantum mechanics, one usually uses the wigner eckhart theorem uh, to derive this, which is certainly a, a much more abstract way to do it. Okay, in the papers uh, that I said at the beginning, I show how you can also obtain all these equations of motion and results directly from local conservation of angular momentum and energy and momentum. Okay, so uh, we're almost at the end. Um, uh, these results have another, uh, 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 several other interesting implications. I mentioned that there's a theorem that goes back to Bohr's PhD thesis in 1911. It was independently uh, discovered by Van Leeuwen in 1919. Um, this is a result that says that once, if you start with the standard Lorentz force law, that you can show uh, that if you have a non-rotating system of particles, like a, a, a bath of particles, a, a, a thermodynamic system of, of lots and lots of charged particles, and you treat everything classically, uh, if you compute the magnetization of, of the system in thermal equilibrium, you can show directly from the Lorentz force law that the average magnetization in thermal equilibrium vanishes. Uh, and and this, this was taken to be a statement that um, diamagnetism uh, cannot show up classically. It requires quantum mechanics in order to show up. Well, the results in this talk provide at least theoretically a loophole. The Lorentz force law uh, does not hold for these particles, particles with uh, classical intrinsic dipole moments. And so the arguments that lead to the Bohr van uh, Leeuwen theorem simply don't hold. Um, now, is this just theoretically uh, a, a curiosity? Is this something that, that actually has significance? Um, ultimately, if you're dealing with, you know, systems of, you know, plasmas of large numbers of charged particles, you know, uh, you know, to the, to, to the extent that you want to deal with, uh, with, with, um, uh, you know, with these questions, you, you, you may want to deal with a quantum case anyway. Is there any value in looking at these systems purely classically? Certainly people who do classical plasma physics, um, you know, uh, People who do, who do high temperature plasma physics often work in a classical approximation in which they ignore the quantum mechanical dipole moments of the particles. Um, however, uh, it, it's entirely you know, possible to imagine that conglomerations of particles suitably coarse grained uh, can act like large classical you know, effective quasi particles with non-zero dipole moments. Uh, and, and then you know, is this formalism then useful for characterizing their interactions? That's an interesting question. Um, and finally, uh, if we're able to attach things like spin directly to these classical particles, does this have implications for how we think about interpretations of quantum theory? In the standard, at least non-relativistic uh, de Broglie-Bohm formulation, Bohmian mechanics, uh, one typically attaches spin not to the particle degrees of freedom, not to the ontology, the underlying particle ontology, but one attaches spin to the wave function. Um, is this necessary? If classical particles can have spin, in particular, you can take these classical particles I was describing, you can take the spin tensor, and you can quantize this system. You promote X and P to operators, you promote S to operator to an operator, and then you can do the standard you know, quantum mechanical approach there. Um, if we can attach these properties already at the level of the classical, of the classical particle, um, does this mean that, that we, we have to make this dichotomy and attach spin to the wave function uh, in contrast to the uh, orbital angular momentum of the particle? Um, this might be particularly important because in, uh, in the non-relativistic case, we have access to simple one particle wave functions um, where we can attach spin to it. In the relativistic case, in relativistic quantum mechanics and in quantum field theory, we don't have easy access to simply definable position space wave functions. And so it's a little bit unclear where spin should be attached to. Um, if we can attach them directly to particles, maybe this offers uh, an alternative approach. 
Good. That's my talk. Thanks. Great. So um, we started a little bit late and I went a little bit long. Um, maybe we'll take five minutes for questions and, and then we'll relegate further questions to the end. Noel, is that okay with you? Okay, great. All right. So let me look at the raised hands tool because now I'm actually paying attention to this. Okay. Um, feel free to raise your hand or just unmute and talk. David. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just taking in a lot of this at once. Uh, just a thought on the very last part about the um, uh, attaching to hidden variables. So I, I take it one aspect of spin that doesn't show up so well in the, in the classical context here is going to be non-commutativity um, of spin in different axes. Um, presumably that's something that's at least going to be a, a thing to, to be cautious with, with the, um, the, the use of spin here being brought into a uh, a Bohmian framework. It's, it's, we're we're going to be in, we're going to be in trouble. I take it if we have particles with um, quantum particles with high spin, where the associated hidden variables try to simultaneously assign definite values to spin in in multiple directions. That's an excellent question. Um, I have a couple of things to say about that. One is we already have non-commutativity of orbital angular momentum, right? Even in the Bohmian case, we have orbital angular momentum, and in the quantum case, that doesn't commute. Uh, and of course, there's non-commutativity between X and P. Those don't commute, uh, even though we simultaneously assign them to the Bohmian particle. Uh, the answer in the Bohmian case is that we assume the particle has uh, a space-time position. Um, we assume it has an underlying momentum, you know, an underlying sort of hidden momentum. And that hidden momentum is not what shows up in experiments. Mm. Right? You do experiments, and what shows up, obviously, it can't show up because you, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle has to hold. You know, you, you, you can't simultaneously measure position and momentum for the particle, even if, if at a hidden level, they're both there. Mm. So there's a dichotomy here between the underlying uh, the ontic property of, of the particle and what you actually see in the experiment. What you see in the experiment are observables that don't commute. So presumably, the same thing would hold for orbit angular momentum and also would hold for spin angular momentum. The particle at an underlying level in the Bohmian picture has a well-defined position, a well-defined uh, linear momentum, well-defined orbital angular momentum, well-defined spin angular momentum, and that, but, but that when you do experiments on these things, you're not directly seeing those. You're seeing the outcomes of experiments, and those outcomes of experiments end up looking non-commutative. Yeah. But I suppose then, I mean, this raises, this is a, a longer term question about, about the Bohmian framework, of course, but, but in, the, in, the, in the position momentum case, of course, there's an asymmetry. Um, the position is, depending how you look at it, by definitional fiat or by dynamical construction, is actually the thing that is going to be directly measured. Um, measurements of momentum, as you say, are going to be contextual. The thing I'm measuring is only, only in some classical limit going to turn out to the object here. And that in turn drives at least some people in the Bohm tradition to be quite minimalist in the property descriptions um, in the framework. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of tradition that goes to Bell of saying, look, all measurements, position measurements, I take it is motivated at least partly by this. It's by wanting to say, well, when we measure position, we really measure position, damn it. When we do another thing we call measuring momentum or whatever, we're really in a complicated position in measurement. And so we should be unmoved or unworried by its disconnect with um with the, the quantum with the, the this classical last time's velocity which i, th I think in the same terms are coherent the, the thought is just i mean in, insofar as we've got some as we have analogous problems here in relativistic particles if we have this this classical quantity called spin but by you know, it's, it, it can't end up being the thing that we measure in a quote spin measurement it sort of starts becoming a little unclear how to interpret it. I mean, I mean, in, in the case of, of, of momentum in the, the Bohm theory, you can just say, well, the momentum definitionally is mass times velocity. The, the momenta supervene on the positions, at least if you look at the system over a period of time. That doesn't seem quite so available in the, the case of these, these particle spins. That's a very fair point. It's worth thinking more about. Um, what I will say, though, is that uh, spin in this story is not showing up only as an observable quantity, mm. right? Spin is playing a bunch of roles here at this classical level. Mm. It's determining all these other subsidiary conditions that mm. classify what kinds of particles you could have, how the particles can behave, their force laws. And these would all still attach, even mm. if spin is not directly observable or if there's some separation between the underlying spin tensor and the spin you'd actually end up measuring. 
Um, so there's still use here, even in that case. And I should say, by the way, this approach is, com is uh, none of this is, this is all a classical story. So I'm not singling out any particular interpretation of quantum theory here. I'm sure there are also interesting implications for other interpretations of quantum theory. It's just most natural at this mm -hmm. stage to talk about, uh, you know, uh, hidden variables type uh, interpretations because those have the, the most obvious correspondence with this classical picture. But I'm sure there are other interesting implications for other interpretations as well. I think maybe one more question and then we'll relegate the rest to, to afterward. I think Chip, you had your hand raised. Chip, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot to talk about with the Bohmian idea there, but let me ask instead about the um, idea that magnetic fields do work. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious you know, if, if I'm fully appreciating what's going on in your proposal here, because I think it's, I've seen it in, in textbooks to talk about, you know, as a limit from an extended body down to a point particle, you can talk about a point particle with an intrinsic magnetic moment. And when you do that, you can ask like, well, what's the potential energy of that particle in a certain magnetic field? And they often calculate that by looking at the amount of work you need to do to get that particle in that arrangement. So sometimes they look at it through the torque law and how much torque needs to be exerted to put it into place or they look at it, bringing it in from infinity. But either way, you ask like, how much work do you need to do? And there you're thinking like work against the work being done by the magnetic field. So, you know, what's the novel bit here beyond that textbook treatment? Oh, oh, okay. So um, in the standard textbook treatment, um, uh, so in, in, in the standard textbook treatment, um, all forces, all electromagnetic forces exerted on charged systems fundamentally arise from the standard Lorentz force law, just Q E plus V cross B. Um, and, and so you see like immediately that if I, you know, try to compute work done in this situation uh, over some displacement, I'm going to dot, uh, I'm going to dot that force into a displacement, which is the displacement of the particle being, you know, acted upon. That's going to be parallel to the particle's instantaneous velocity. And then the term involving V cross B is just identically always going to disappear. So anytime yeah, so you think, I, I think work is, is going up, say, sorry again. Oh, I, I was going to say, I mean, I, I, I've seen the del mu dot B kind of term added to the force law. And then there's also a new term you need for torque if you're going to deal with point particles with right. intrinsic magnetic right. moment. So I agree point particles with the standard Lorentz floor. I feel Oh, you're breaking up there. Sorry, Chip. I couldn't hear that last point. Okay. Well, I was just saying, um, yes, it's, it's only with the additional terms that you have the, um, it, only with the additional term that you get the work being done, but right. those additional terms do appear in textbook oh, treatments yeah, they when they try to ascribute uh, that, magnetic that's, moment. That's correct. Um, they do sometimes appear in textbooks, uh, but they're generally ad hoc. Right, you take the Lorentz force law, you just empirically say, well, you know, forces do act on dipoles, quantum mechanics, something, something, something. We're just going to stick this term into the force law. But where does it come from? Why is it there? Why did it have to be there? Um, and, it, and is it consistent to put it there? In particular, is it consistent with special relativity to put there? Like that force law that's, I mean, the Lorentz force law does not look, in, when it's written in three vector language, it does not look manifestly Lorentz invariant, but it is. Um, it's fundamentally Lorentz invariant because of the transformation behavior of E and B. If you just stick on uh, a, a grad mu dot B term, it's not obvious that that is, that that phenomenological ad hoc correction you've made is consistent with the internal Lorentz invariance of the theory. It's not, it's not clear where it comes from. It's not clear whether you're violating energy conservation or doing something that you shouldn't be doing. Okay, um, that's fair. And, and here we're seeing it, it just arise emergent, like automatically. Like it, it literally cannot be any different from how it is here. Cool. All right. Okay. So if people have further questions, maybe we'll hang on to the end. Um, Noel, do you, you want to go? Are you ready to go? Uh, I can. If you want to take a break, we could take a five minute break for folks. But That'd be great. I'm also going to stop the recording and yeah. I'll start it again once you're ready to go. So five minutes, everybody.